podcast at the Cornell School of Contemporary Music, How to Become a Professional Musician. And that's the reason why we have an icon, a really, really, really professional musician today with us. So this is an honor. I am Lorna Earnshaw. I'm a musician. I'm a journalist. I'm an online entrepreneur. And I'm here sitting with one of the legends of the music, of the contemporary music. I'm sitting here right next to Dr. Abram Laboriel. So Abram Laboriel, he's one of the most recorded artists uh, nowadays, since 1971. We are in Los Angeles, California, where there have been uh, recorded a lot, a lot of amazing records, amazing albums. Um, with his, he's already recorded with artists like Christina Aguilera, uh, Lionel Richie, Diana Ross, Julio Iglesias. I mean, there are a lot of people that can be mentioned right now. He's laughing. I have to tell you about that. Yes. <laughs> and I think he's the right person to tell us how to become professional musicians. I feel so honored for being your student here. Uh, I learned. I I learned a lot of things every day. You know, we we have a great time together. Yes. And that's the that's the thing that shocks me the most about Abram, which is the joy of playing music, and yeah. that is something that is present all the time, and that I'm learning from Abram. Beautiful. So uh, for me, it's such and an it's true. Yeah. <laughs> For me, such an honor. Welcome, Abram. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. This is our first episode at the Cornell School of Contemporary Music podcast. And Abram is one of the teachers at the Cornell School of Contemporary Music. How awesome is that? It's a privilege. <laughs> We have seen you playing in such an amazing way with your whole heart. And I remember that there is something that you always talked about us, like what is the importance for you to play in any moment in your life? <laughs> that is something that is in my head that I always think about. What is important for you? Well, uh, this is going to be a little bit of a lesson. I've always believed that the moment a musician puts their hands on their instrument or the moment a singer starts singing, even if there are exercises, the moment anybody starts dancing, even if it is a technical thing, you have to allow yourself to feel something real. Don't put your hands on your instrument and go through the exercise without feeling something. Why? Because anything you practice, anything you play, will become part of your performance. And if you're practicing without feeling, thinking that it is not important, then when it's really important, you are not going to do anything but what you've been practicing. So that's part of the reason why there is joy, and that's part of the reason why there is commitment, and that's part of the reason why to be called a professional musician has to do with the fact that it is 
a lifetime commitment and it's a very serious thing. And my mother always said, life is too serious to be taken seriously. <laughs> so you must just have a good time whenever you can. So and what advice would you give to those who dream of becoming musicians? Well, the most important thing about being a musician, and especially about being a professional musician, is to be a good listener. Listen, listen, and then listen some more. Uh, the moment musicians are listening to each other and exchanging all these ideas, they start creating a sound that neither one of them can produce by themselves. And that comes as a result of the respect and the love that is built into the listening. And uh, trust me, to be a professional musician is the fulfillment of many, many, many dreams. So whatever dreams you have, you can pour them into your music and then share them with everybody you meet and you watch them experiencing the same joy and hope that you have inside. It's fun. <laughs> But what do you think about their actions that people should take in order to become professional musicians? Well, uh, there's a famous phrase by Charlie Parker, you know, learn all your scales, you know. That's a major scale. He says, learn all your scales. So whether it's major, minor, augmented, diminished. He says, learn all your chords, you know. Then he says, learn all your melodies, you know. But then, he says, when the time comes to make music, forget everything and just make music. So, this comes as a result of practicing your scales, practicing your chords, practicing your rhythms, knowing the melodies, knowing how to accompany somebody, but then when the time comes to make music, just make music from your heart and communicate. Communicate as a result of listening. And if you would talk about the most important things that a bass player should uh, be working on technically, the things that you work with your students, what, what are the things that you would mention? The most important thing uh, that I work with my students is the sense of time. And that's something that is very important, in particular to bass players, but for everybody that is making music. Uh, you might be familiar with the expression, you're rushing, you're dragging, you are not phrasing it right. All of that is a problem that happens because of the sense of time. So I spend a lot of time with the musicians working on how to feel, you know, like if these are straight eights, one, two, three, four. So the quality of the sound might change. But the one, two, three, or should not change the sense of time. And I spend all my energy just instilling that into the students, develop a strong sense of time. And then if you come and study with me, I'll teach you how to feel time in the three traditional ways. On the click with a metronome, behind the metronome, and ahead of the metronome. All three are very, very important part of the expression of music and professional musicians are very comfortable making adjustments depending on what the passage of the music requires. Do you think that really someone can develop that sense of rhythm, that groove? Because I think that there are a lot of people that are asking themselves, oh, I, I don't have a good rhythm, I can't do that. Do you think that you can develop that? 
Yes, you can, but that's when uh, the word community becomes essential. There is an, I'm going to give you an extreme. There is an island somewhere in the Pacific, I don't know the name of the island, where half the citizens fill time in 19, and half the citizens fill time in 21. What do you mean, like 19? So 21. 19 beats, you know, oh, okay. the, for your 18, 19, 1. Okay, two, like the know. accent. Yeah, all equal divisions of 19 beats, okay. you know, 19, 1. The other ones feel 21. Mm -hmm. So they start together, 1, 2, mm -hmm. and then in the middle they get separated. Mm -hmm. The ones that are playing in 21 are going to play a little bit faster. So you start hearing this thing that almost sounds the same, then you start hearing some separation, mm -hmm. and then when they get to 21, they are together. Mm -hmm. And so community is how people develop a sense of time, you know. Oh, interesting. Uh, if everybody goes, you know, so good, so good. Yes. So good. People develop that as a community. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people who, who are not raised in that culture will go, so good. Uh -huh. And they will, so good. Mm -hmm. yes. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the reason why it is so important to belong to a community of exactly. musicians, playing in bands, hanging out with other musicians. And developing developing a, a language, a common language, that becomes their style of expressing a song. So we already talked about how to become a musician, how to get the skills, how to get the heart, and now let's talk about how to make it, make a living as a musician. You're very successful as a professional professional musician, and I would like you to give us a couple of advice about how to get the gigs, how to treat people. I noticed that you're a very cheerful person, a very fun person. I guess that has a lot to do. So would like to talk to us a little bit about how the relationships happen for you to get gigs. Is, is that important? It is. Yesterday I was talking with this uh, woman guitarist from Arkansas. And she was telling me that she ran into a Brazilian percussionist who said to her, you know, musicians, we are called to be servers. And I really like that. Because the correct expression, if you are not from Brazil would be, we are called to serve each other with a musical gift. And so when, when you're trying to get a job, people are looking for someone that would help them achieve their musical idea or their musical goal. So the best way to get a job is to call people and say, I need you to listen to what I can do to help you with your music. The other thing is that uh, because most people right now are too busy and they already have developed their circle of friends that they're comfortable with, uh, then what you do is you just continue to develop your musical style, your strength, your ability, prepare yourself so that if any time any of these people says, you know, my bass player got sick or he has another job or he's not available, you say that you can come and help me, let me see what you mean by that. So you just call, network, put the word out, but never stop growing and preparing yourself for that one opportunity that's going to come and people are going to discover that whenever you're around, you are helping them with their music. As opposed to, well, okay, what do you want? You know, what do you need? Mm -hmm. I already played it once, I'm not going to play it again. That's not a good attitude to get a job. Okay, that, that's a great tip. Yeah, yeah. That's a great tip yeah. because I think that many times the artists think that they are the center of the universe and that life and people should add up to them. Exactly. So and that's very that's dangerous. A tip. When, you, when you don't have a teachable spirit and you say, well, this is how I feel the song, this is what I think the song needs, and, and you are ignoring the people that are hiring you, what their vision is and what their dream is, then they feel oppressed by hiring mm -hmm. you. And man, this guy doesn't want to do anything I'm asking him to do. And they're not going to call you back. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> not only that, but they may fire you and get somebody else. <laughs> yeah. 
um, what what about um, the, the situation of people that say, okay, I can I can play by ear. I really don't have. I don't, really don't need a professional training. Do you think that that is a uh, how how is that? What, what what are your thoughts about that? The problem is that the people that do that cannot necessarily be considered professional. Uh, there are certain situations where, like if you belong to a family or a church or a, a specific ethnic group um, that says, okay, when we play, we feel it this way. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel it that way, then you cannot play with us. Well, how do I learn to feel that way? Well, you have to live with us, and you have to eat what we eat, and you have to be raised in this community. So the, right away, it becomes a lot of barriers. Mm -hmm. But when we are professional musicians, uh, we are making, let's say, a film where they want us to play tango for two minutes, you know? Cha-cha-cha. Mm -hmm. So every two minutes they may require something else from us. And so we listen to the records of these people that are tight communities where they are masters of one style. Mm -hmm. But if you bring those people to do a film, they'll play the tango really well. But when you ask them to do something else, they, they say, well, no, that's not what we grew up with. Mm -hmm. They play cha-cha-cha really well. But when you ask them to do heavy metal, they don't know what to do. Yeah, that's why you learn to do in school. Like you learn solfege, you learn how to lo how to read a music sheet. Exactly. Right. So maybe right. that's the, all that rhythm, all the. You develop flexibility and you develop versatility, so that when people say to you, "Man, you know, I know that you are not from Mexico, or I know that you are not Cuban, or you are not Korean," but you know. You can read. You know, you learn to do that as a professional musician to help people achieve their dreams. So they should learn how people should learn how to read music. People have to learn how to read and how to speak music, and how to feel music, and how to eat music. <laughs> it's got to become an essential part of what feeds you every day. You know? And uh, I just wanted to ta ask you about uh, your, not your personal life, but about how is uh, to live a personal, to have a personal life, a family, being a musician. There are people that are kind of afraid of uh, becoming musicians because they think that if you're a musician, you really can't have a personal life or can't fa have a family. I'm sure, I know that it's not your case, right? Well, um, I'm going to say something about that. Artists, in general, are excused for being very temperamental. And they use that excuse as a way of refusing to grow up. Well, you know, I'm an artist. I am not like everybody else. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I don't feel like talking to you. I don't feel like doing this. I don't feel like showing up to do my work, you know. All of that really has to stop. One of the things that I learned as a child is that uh, to be born ignorant is nobody's fault, but to remain is everybody's responsibility. And so you have to seek people that teach you, that prepare you, that transform you, that inspire you, and that help you recognize that all this nonsense of uh, I am special because I'm an artist has to stop. Artists reflect society, and society depends on having an artist to inspire them. So we cannot continue to say, well, I'm an artist, I can do anything I want. You mean I like can... being a father, being a husband? Is it yeah, uh, that's the thing. You see, you cannot say, because I'm an artist, I don't have responsibilities to my home, to my family, to my children, to my wife. You know, mm -hmm. you do. And... Uh, 
and your music, trust me when I tell you, your music will become better and stronger the more you take care of your loved ones, the more you are available to help them with their needs. And he says, man, but I needed to practice eight hours every day. Now that I have a, a wife and a child, I can only practice two hours a day and that's not good enough. Trust me, those two hours are going to make the world a happier place than eight hours where you just do anything you want and you don't care who likes it or who doesn't like it. Trust me. Wow, that, that, that was, that was intense. You know. That really touched my heart. Thank oh, it's so nice. <laughs> it's been such an honor. I've learned a lot with you. I am sure that all the things that you've been telling are going to help a lot of people. I pray. I, I'm, I'm sure I'm positive that this is going to help a lot of people that are listening to us. Yeah. That are asking for some support for their dream. So I'm very, very thankful to you. I'm so proud that uh, to be your student. Thank you. And, you. and I think that we are so, so lucky to have you here at the Cornell School of Contemporary Music. I think this is such a blessing. So thank you so much, thank you. Abram. And in the same way I'm having this opportunity with you, we invite you to come and have that opportunity with all of us. Okay, come so, yeah, that, that was awesome, right? I'm shocked <laughs> for all the, that valuable information, all these words. So thank you so much for joining us. We'll be in touch, hopefully talking, because I think we should spend hours and hours talking with Abram and we would never get bored and there would be millions of things for us to learn. So thank you so much. Thank you, Abram. And see you next time. And we will be waiting for you here at the Cornell School of Contemporary Music at the Shepherd University in Los Angeles, California. Mm -hmm.